Thank you for joining us for this discussion on managing currency risk. I'm Lisa Danino Lewis, the Chief Growth Officer at CLS, and I'm joined today by Natsumi Natsuba. CLS is created for the FX market by the market, and CLS Settlement provides FX participants globally with material, operational, and settlement efficiencies for the post trade workflow of FX transactions. Hi, Lisa. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you um, about settlement risk and what we do here at Russell Investments. Um, my name is Natsumi. I run the FX trading team here um, out of Seattle. Um, I have been, uh, I was actually an equity trader at Morgan Stanley for 10 years prior to me joining Russell Investments six years ago as an FX trader. So I have both backgrounds. Um, agency FX at Russell, we are an agent only. And uh, last year we traded 700 and about 50 billion US dollars. Our objective is to get the best performance um, in your foreign investments when you repatriate your uh, foreign currencies back to your um, root currency. Um, with that, shall we start with some uh, Q&A? Fantastic. Thank you, Natsumi. Today, we're going to take a look at the Australian market and the superannuation funds and what they can do to manage risk uh, associated with foreign exchange trading. I guess let's start with looking at that environment. Natsumi, tell us a little bit about the current trends that you're seeing in the Australian market at the moment. Sure. Um, so I hear a lot, obviously, from the news and the media. I also speak to our clients that are the superannuation funds or clients of ours, investment managers that are hired by superannuation funds. And of course, my coworkers over in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, but the main thing or a few of the things that obviously stick out are consolidation and um, that often leads to internalization of these funds. Um, other things that are focused uh, trends, I guess, is ESG that goes for every um, fund or every company in the world of late. Um, but specifically to the superannuation fund industry, um, performance, um, cost cutting, and uh, the transparency in what they do, uh, I believe, uh, are the main things that I do hear a lot from our clients. So with the fund industry increasingly focused on foreign investment, including that move away from traditional more into the emerging markets. How have you seen the management of foreign exchange evolve for the industry? And also, you know, what, what are you seeing at Russell? Um, I think there's a few things that have, that's really evolved. Um, and I think one of them would be the uh, settlement counterparty credit that we look at, especially with the geopolitical risk going on. Um, increased, I think, heightened sense of just geopolitical risk. So you want to make sure that in those foreign currencies or foreign investments that you're making, you are facing a counterparty kind of that is reliable on the credit side. Um, and within Russell Investments, we do have a proper credit team that man monitors. And we also have a, an internal uh, board with all the head of trading and our credit team and portfolio managers that sometimes will participate in order to make sure that our counterparties are all meeting a certain criteria. And we would um, have a meeting on a quarterly basis to review and make sure that the counterparties that we do we have selected are in line to standards. Um, and you know that goes without saying. You know, if one payment is made and the other isn't because of um, you know, credit risk or whatever it may be. We don't want that to be a thing. We want to make sure, you know, some of the tenors that people trade are, you know, three months, six months, one year, two years out. And so within that period, obviously a lot can happen. So the counterparty kind of risk in terms of credit is really important. So I think people are reviewing it more uh, rigorously. Um, another is technology. Um, people are, I mean, financial firms are no longer just a finance firm, it's a technology firm. People are putting a lot of um, money and investments into their technology to make sure we meet cutoffs. Um, you know, when there's settlement involved in large figures, um, you want to make sure that those um, payments are made smoothly and you want to make sure that you know, it's done within a certain time frame. And of course, there's, you know, time time zones. We, you know, for example, you and I are in a completely different time zone right now. And, you know, it's already, you know, afternoon for you, whereas it's still pretty early in the morning for me. So 
you know, for you, you might expect your payment to be made right now, but for me, it's, you know, the day just started. So with that, you know, our technology, while we're sleeping, all that money can move without human intervention. So technology is something really important. I think a lot of people have emphasized on. And thirdly, I think, um, with foreign investments, people are moving more to not necessarily investing or um, hedging currencies that um, are riskier or a smaller part of their um, entire basket, especially those that are trading indices, which Russell does. We don't want to necessarily hedge every single currency in the emerging market space. We use proxy currencies sometimes um, just so that you know it does uh, move simultaneously with that currency that we actually do have exposure, but doesn't necessarily mean we have to trade in that currency, be it because it's restricted or it could be just that, you know, it's uh, too expensive to hedge. So I think those are the things people are more conscious about for cost, for risk mitigation. Um, But yeah, I think um, Another thing I I failed to mention, I think people are starting to look at um, using, utilizing prime brokers as well, just so that they can step in when there is credit risk. So that when you are facing a counterparty or a subcustodian that is, you know, settling your trades um, that you don't really have a relationship with, you want to utilize a prime broker that does that does have the relationship so that everything goes smoothly. That makes sense. I mean, when you're, you're talking there, a couple of points, you, you mentioned the technology side of it. Obviously, you know, Russell, um, you know, you're up there in terms of the technology stack you have in place. And at CLS, we've just done a lot of work on ours. But how much awareness do you think the actual fund market in Australia has of that? And also, you know, in the settlement risk area, do you think they um, are aware of the impacts and the risks there and and what more can be done? Are you finding that the clients that you meet in that market are aware of you know, PVP and the importance of it? Or do you think there are still gaps? I think there's still big gaps. And I think that's where you know, we come in. Um, a lot of our prospect clients are not quite aware of a, the costs that incur- are incurred with foreign investments. Everyone unfortunately still sees foreign investment and the currency repatriation part to just be a, the, the settlement component to any foreign investments. And they don't really see that there's a lot of risk involved in foreign investments, be it the settlement component or just the cost part. Like you have, you may have made a huge gain or a huge profit um, in a foreign investment, but then when you repatriate that currency back to your base currency, you're, you may be losing out on a lot of the um, profits that you made. And I think it's, there's a big gap, the one, the sophisticated um, foreign investors that's been doing it for a long time, I think, and Australian um, super funds, I think the majority of them are very conscious of it and are very um, ahead in terms of knowing that foreign investments, you know, have a lot more to do with, you know, there is a lot more than just, oh, investing in a stock or invest, investing in whatever, you know, a real estate and it goes up and you make money. I think people are more conscious of what goes, what, enta- what it entails. Um, but with that said, there's still, a, I think, a large gap um, in terms of the risk that's associated because, you know, the settlement cycle, as you know, it's, it's getting crunched and crunched to the point, you know, for example, Japan equities 10 years ago was T plus three settlement and now it's T plus two and everyone's still, you know, we're continuing to talk about T plus one settlement. So with that said, um, there is a large gap. I think people are starting to be more and more aware of it. Um, Hence, we have these prospect clients that are like, hey, you know, what kind of savings can you do for us? And, you know, I would throw them an example, like if you trade a billion dollars, for example, then this is from our third party um, TCA provider. But we did hear that in 2021, um, I believe they assessed 14 or 16 trillion dollars worth um, of uh, flow, but they said that custodian banks on average charge about 10.4 basis points, um, whereas Russell's performance was 0.47 basis points. And if you put that in notional amount, that's um, one million dollars in cost with custodians, and with Russell, it's 47,500, or you know, a much much smaller figure. It's like a million dollar difference, basically, um, in cost. Um, yeah. So with that said. Um, I think people are starting to be more aware of uh, the cost component, but then the settlement component, I think, is still lagging in that if you don't settle your trades after this great performance, you may lose 
a lot of money on the overdraft charges. And so that's something we're trying to educate our clients as well, that, you know, we do take care of the cost. We do get the best performance that we can for them. But at the same time, they need to be cognizant of the settlement component. And I get a lot of, oh, like that never really occurred to me kind of um, facial expressions. So it's interesting that you mentioned the the custodian costs, because if we look back historically, you know, many funds were reluctant to trade outside of just more than one counterparty, preferring the custodial execution due to the fact that there was some process and, and settlement risk associated with that. And I think, um, you know, the where CLS comes into it, the advent of that P- PVP and that settlement risk mitigation has opened up opportunities for funds now to, to trade elsewhere and therefore be able to, you know, custodian execution still has its place without doubt, but have more options um, to follow the process of best execution um, and getting past that point of being locked in just to one provider. So I think, you know, it's interesting to hear that the, you know, the, the benefits they can have with trading for Russell versus another counterparty. But I think some of that comfort from the fund industry has really been around that. Also, what happens post-trade? So when we look at, you know, the CLS side of things, you know, we basically look at everything post-trade and by the clients settling on CLS settlement, they have surety that that settlement risk mitigation is in place. So it opens up that trading. I think another, you know, contribution that CLS has made when we look at the market in, in, in the whole, you know, in 2001, the BIS survey looked at the market and assessed it to, around, to stand at around $1.2 trillion average daily volume. And when we look at the last survey, obviously we're waiting for the new one to come out, which is due any day now. But back in 2019, we saw that market grow to $6.6 trillion. And I think a lot of that, again, has been able to, to, the market has been able to grow with the benefit of knowing that CLS and that settlement risk mitigation is in place. So we've seen that from CLS side of things, you know, we see a lot of um, growth from the fund industry. When I look at our new growth statistics within CLS settlement, it really does come from uh, predominantly the fund industry at the moment, around 90% of that new growth number comes from funds, uh, which equates to about between 80 and 100 billion average daily volume. So it's a huge amount. And, uh, and that's been the picture really for the last 18 months. So really focused on that fund growth. And when I look at the Australian market in particular, back in uh, 2020, our last stats that we ran there, about a quarter of the Australian's largest superannuation funds utilize CLS settlement as well. So Lisa, what do you think can be done more to drive industry adoption um, of using PVP or CLS to um, achieve PVP settlement? It's a great question, Natsumi. We've seen a heightened regulatory focus on PVP, again, since that um, the December 2019 BIS quarterly report, which highlighted an increase in settlement risk. Also, the strengthening, actually, of the FX Global Code last July, which focused on particularly principles around settlement risk, principles 35 and 50, again, just shows that focus uh, on best practice for the market. So I guess there's a couple of things that that the fund market should look at. One, I think, when we look at adoption of the FX Global Code, very much Southside has adopted that, um, the code and uh, attested to it, but we're still seeing, you know, only a smaller percentage uh, of the fund industry. So I think there's some education that still needs to be done. And actually, I was on a, on a panel recently with a couple of members of the, the GFXC talking about, you know, the supports and the metrics that are being put in place uh, to help the buy side adopt the code. In terms of driving PVP, you know, the increase, I guess, or some of the increase that we've seen in the amount of settlement risk that isn't being mitigated by by a PVP has been obviously in emerging markets and additional currencies outside of CLS settlement. Mm. And from the 2019 BIS report, I think they estimated just over 1 trillion, 1.2 trillion um, ADV in that market. When we look at CLS settlement, to, to add currencies to CLS settlement is not an easy endeavor. It's an extended effort with many complex factors. 
including legal risk and liquidity standards. And they have to be applied within the relevant jurisdictions. And you mentioned it earlier, uh, Natsumi, around the geopolitical environment. You know, the current regulatory and geopolitical landscape makes putting that in place in many of these jurisdictions pretty challenging at present. So I think we have to encourage uh, the adoption of PVP where possible. And that is also making sure that the not just obviously the global custodians, but the regional custodians can support their clients in that endeavor. Um, also, where we can't, uh, we haven't got PVP uh, available in the market, it's looking at what is the next solution uh, to have that in place. And at CLS, we're always looking at what we can do in that, uh, in the other currencies outside of CLS settlement. And as soon as it is viable for us to look at those currencies and the geopolitics allows that, then we will we'll look to, to see what we can offer. But in the meantime, and again, this was highlighted in the global code, that where PVP isn't possible to automate the netted or the settlement netting process as much as possible. So making sure that fund managers and funds net where possible, automate that process um, again as much as possible. CLS introduced a product a couple of years back called CLS Net, which really does focus on the market outside of CLS settlement. And whilst it doesn't um, at, at the moment allow for PVP settlement, what we do do is fully automate that netting process, which at the moment always has a couple of manual steps in it, regardless of how, how robust and how, you know, up to date the technology stack is for netting in one organization, because they don't talk to each other on the same network, you're never going to get that full SDP. So CLS sort of bridges that gap um, and is the conduit and the standardized mechanism to automate that netting. So we're trying to support the market uh, through that process. We've seen some good traction on that, but I, I think the focus still remains uh, for the fund industry. And again, we touched on it earlier for the Australian market to make sure that they understand and are educated on what is best practice and also how it can benefit. So it's not just this is what you should do because the regulators would like it to be, but still, you know, the benefits of streamlining their operations because utilizing CLS, once you've done the FX execution, effectively that back office process to, to a large degree is outsourced to your custodian and reconciliation at the end of the flow is really the piece you need to do. So it allows you to have less manpower on that particular function and reallocate resources elsewhere. But again, Natsumi, you mentioned it earlier about the benefits of opening up your execution pool and the, the revenue that you can save from potentially going out to a, a wider pool uh, for market prices. Yeah, I completely agree with a lot of the points you made there. Um, some, a lot of them resonated with me. I think, you know, like we were saying earlier, no matter how much you prof profit you make, if the settlement piece doesn't go well, it's just as important in investments and foreign investments. Um, and even if you can't settle CLS for a lot of the emerging market currencies that you may want to, I think it does put our operations team that works tirelessly to make sure everything settles correctly at ease when they know that the bulk of the, you know, the majority of the volume that's traded are in the currencies that you can settle in CLS. And so they don't even have to focus on those currencies. They can just let those flow and settle on its own and it's done, you know, beautifully. When you do need, what you do need to focus on are the currencies that are a little more difficult, but at least they can put their efforts and their focus on those currencies and not have to worry about the bulk of the flow that goes through our, our, um, our flow, our pad. And so with that, um, you know, we do hope for more currencies to be CLS eligible. Um, but with, you know, with all that said, what we currently have, I think really does help. Just leading to another question is, you know, with, I think I noted very briefly earlier, but the settlement cycle is getting, you know, looked at more and they're thinking about making a lot of the settlement cycles T plus one. I think the movement has, already been established, especially on the equity side. Um, I know that we have CLS cutoff times as well. And then each custodian or each bank has their own, again, cutoff times, which makes all these, you know, the time frame to get things settled 
tighter and tighter. With that, is there any movement within CLS to give us a little more flexibility when we can submit CLS settlement instructions? I think that's a brilliant question, Natsumi, and I think it's it's a perfect opportunity for me to talk a little bit about, obviously, the, the cutoff times that we have at CLS and the way it works. So, obviously, there's a lot of focus, as you rightly say, around this move to T plus one. CLS accepts everything uh, from T plus one. So, you know, it's not outside the scope of what we already support. And in fact, in terms of our cutoff times to our members, members can still in, um, submit instructions up to 6 uh, a.m. the same day. Um, so the, the challenge that we have, I think, as an industry, um, resides really with the custodians and the cutoff times that they feel comfortable with in order to get their instructions from their clients to then get those into CLS. So I think as the market moves to that T plus one or more emphasis on that and focus on T plus one, I think the custodians will need to have a look again at potentially maybe rationalizing, you know, how they they set their cutoff times and their processes to see how much more efficient that can be because the constraints that currently fell aren't ones that are imposed by CLS, unfortunately. So, and, and obviously we completely understand that our members and custodians have a whole host of different processes that run before those instructions get to CLS. Um, but that's the real challenge, I think, for the market. So from a CLS perspective, our cutoff off times won't, won't change because, again, um, there is no real constraint for our members, uh, even into the day of settlement or the, the morning before settlement starts. It really is looking and, and, and a, a challenge for the custodians and, and our other members to look at those cutoff times that they impose on their clients and how much more efficiency can be gained to make that longer. And I think also, and, and Sumi, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you've obviously uh, you've, you've been in the market a while. I think those cutoff times obviously also vary, not just by institution by institution, but for their clients as well. Different clients have different cutoff times. So it's, it's trying to, I guess, get a standardized approach uh, in the market outside of CLS. We're very standard in the way we apply it to our clients. So hopefully that's clarified your question a little. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's always been kind of a sticking point, the cutoff times at not necessarily CLS, but more so at the custodian level, because it all differs. And we trade in so many different custodian accounts that, you know, you just tend to use the most conservative time. And so sometimes it really does restrict you from getting a lot of things done that you wanted to because of the cutoff time. You just try to get things in quickly just to meet that cutoff time. And so, um you know, it would be comforting to know if whether, you know, it's the clients can that can drive the change. And it's, you know, the institutions like yourselves that can also drive the change to have these custodian banks perhaps um, enhance our technology or whatever it may be, if possible, where possible to give us a little more runway and a little more time to, um, you know, settle things in the most efficient way possible rather than, you know, jamming it all down. And, you know, we, we would have to manually intervene so that we can just get that settlement through um, because, you know, it, it really does defeat the purpose of the good work that we do on the trading side, you know, getting the best X, but then if the settlement component doesn't go well, then, you know, a lot of the gains or the, the good performance get gets washed out. So I think all these changes really do get driven by clients, like the large funds, like the superannuation funds. So I'm hoping that, you know, with more efforts and with more education around um, settlement and the fact that things are changing to make settlement even more difficult, clients can drive the change with their custodian banks because essentially, you know, it's the clients that can make that big difference. Definitely. And look, the market will struggle to get to T plus one if the settlements can't be made. So it, the, the two go hand in hand. And, you know, I think as that discussion and journey progresses, we'll see more and more you know, industry working groups, et cetera, looking at those different challenges that we face around that T plus one environment. So Natsumi, what are your views on the recent regulatory updates uh, regarding further consolidation of the super funds? Do you think they're keeping pace with global regulation? I think they are doing a pretty good job with, you know, keeping everything 
as close as possible to benchmark and, you know, not diverting, be it super, you know, negative or super positive. I think it's very strict. Um, is it keeping up with the global? Uh, absolutely. I think maybe they've gone even a step further in some instances. Um, and, you know, it's comforting, you know, especially when it comes to pension money, it's our, you know, our livelihood in the future. And so it's nice to have the regulators take it very, very seriously to the, to the next level. Um, you know, the whole performance test, I think it's a little, it's very strict. And I think it's, um, you know, your future, your super, it's great. I, I wish, you know, I, I do want people to look after my money as strictly as they do. So, yeah, I think um, they have kept up with the global um, regulation and, um, you know, the slippage tests, you know, um, going back to eight years and whatnot. I think it's, uh, it's admirable, but I do kind of feel for these funds and the portfolio managers, they must be <laughs> going through quite a bit to make sure they keep up with it. And, you know, I, I believe it does get publicized, the performance. And so, you know, I pray for, <laughs> for everyone to, to <laughs> keep up with that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely um, up there in terms of proper regulation, I would say. Thank you. And is there anything else specific to the the Australian market, the superannuations that we haven't touched on, or we think might be be useful in this discussion? Um, I think one thing that I did very briefly touch upon is transparency. And that's one of the other things that the regulators are really, I, I have been hearing that is very important for the superannuation funds or any funds, you know, in the EMEA region as well. It's very important, you know, with MIFID and whatnot. We have to make sure that our clients know exactly how your, you know, your trades are being processed. And at Russell, we provide internal TCA reports, external third-party TCA reports. We show exactly what the execution rate was with what kind of party banks. We have 27 on our panel right now that are where we can execute against. And so, you know, from different regions just to get the best outcome. And I think, you know, with, with that, um, yeah, uh, transparency is one thing that, um, you know, like in, in terms of settlement as well, if you can settle it, through CLS or PVP, there's more transparency as to, you know, like the flow of everything in terms of where the money is coming from, where it's going, you know, the whole, um, uh, you know, anti-money laundering, all of that is, you know, tied to transparency to make sure that everything is legitimate, be it your execution or the settlement component, you know, from the beginning till the end, the entire life cycle of your investment. So with that, I think, you know, um, the regulators, going back to our original, you know, for our, our question um, in terms of regulations and, you know, what the, you know, the big um, governing entities are doing, I think it, it does make a lot of sense. And I think, um, yeah, uh, the, the Australian regulators are um, on point there. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, all of that sort of wraps around and is is all about best practice, really, in the market and what all of those different aspects that the the, the fund managers should look at. I mean, do you have a, a view, and I, I'm interested to, to hear your thoughts on why adoption of the code has been slower? I mean, in the, in the the on the buy side overall, not just, you know, in the Australian market, but in, in general. I'm not sure. I, I know that we signed on to it in 2017. Um, so I'm pretty aware of the code of, you know, the FX code of conduct. I think, um, I think it's education. I think it just needs to be um, talked about more. It needs to be taken a little more seriously. I think people are doing everything that they can in this busy times. And then, you know, with COVID and all this other crazy stuff going on in the world, I think it's just easy to miss something that's not regulation. It's not something where mm -hmm. it will, you know, make a difference in how much money is in your pocket. It's, a, it's great practice. And, you know, I think with ESG and whatnot, it is something that can be more, um, I think it's something that people can get around to if it's focused on a little more. So I think that really does, unfortunately, because it doesn't translate to, you know, how it, it's not a necessity, I wouldn't want to say necessity, but it's just not governed well enough. Maybe that's why it's a slower process for people to adopt. So I'm hoping that, you know, with more um, people signing on or with more marketing or just with more talks within the FX community, 
that this is a thing that this everyone should be adopting more. And like you were saying, it's, you know, the sell side have adopted to it. It's the, it's the funds. I think it has to do with just not having the resources for someone to actually take a close look at these. You know, it, it is not a short, you know, code. It, there's a lot of components to it. And I think to sign on to it, you really have to be, you know, conscious of what is said in there. And maybe just, people just don't have, you know, they have other priorities that gets taken over. Yeah, I think that's that's a valid point. I mean, there are 55 principles and and whilst they may apply, you know, across the board to the larger global banks, when you're on the, the buy side, you'll look at it and go, well, actually, out of these 55, they're not all pertinent to me. And I think you're, you're absolutely right in terms of that focus needs to be on education and resource. It was actually, I mentioned I was on a conference recently and, and one of those discussion points was about the resource that needed to go into to looking at this. So I, I think it's something that the market needs to, to focus on uh, and help the, the buy side with. You know, there's always that balance between making a regulation as opposed to, you know, a code uh, that uh, the market sort of adheres to willingly. Um, and, and I... Again, we always, there's, I was going to say we always push back. It's not, that's not the right term, but that that balance again of, of finding what, what level you want it to be because, you know, making the code a regulation obviously then makes it much more onerous for everyone involved. So it's mm-hmm. finding that that fine line and that balance, but definitely that's um, that's something, you know, from, from the CLS perspective, like yourselves, we've adhered to the code, uh, to the code as a market infrastructure. Um, and we'd love to see, more on the buy side looking at that as well. I agree. I don't think it needs to be a regulation. I, I hope that people will have enough, you know, um, integrity and the, the you know, ambition to make sure they're, they are up to code. And I, I, I do truly believe people are. It's just resources really that are constrained and thus it's, it's very slow. But I think the more we talk about it and the more people will start making it a main focus, they can, you know, it's a marketing tool too. You can advertise it on your website saying we do adhere to the global code of conduct and FX code. Um, I think it does, it will really help if it becomes more of like a buzz around the community. That's Umi, thank you. It's been really great to speak to you today. And I think we've covered some really insightful topics uh, pertinent not just to the Australian superannuation funds but to the fund industry as a whole so thank you very much for your time it's been great talking to you the pleasure is all mine and thank you so much for having me again I had a lot of fun very educational like I said we're a big fan of CLS so um, we wish you the best of luck with new currencies hopefully you can tackle (laughs) we'll do our best (laughs) when we can Thank thank you